welcome, Hello. welcome. Hi. Hi, and welcome to the Sinners Live. What's going on? Nothing. I'm just doing a live stream in front of a bunch of your fans. Nice. Should I put should I put my headset on or can you hear me like this? Oh, we can hear you fine like this. Oh, all right, fine then. I won't put my headset on. All right, so there are two questions we have to get off uh, first, and I'm sorry for this. What's your favorite type of ice cream? Uh, well, I do have an answer for that, but it's not the answer that anyone ever likes to hear, and the answer is vanilla. Actually, we've got a few people that have said that. <laughs> All right. I, I, it's de it is definitely my favorite. <laughs> Nothing special on it, just vanilla? Yep, plain. <laughs> All right, and the second question is, you voice in a lot of video games. Are you, in fact, a gamer yourself? Uh, no, I'm not, and um, I don't really know why, because I I could get a game set up uh, with my TV and hang out and play games. I just don't. Oh, there's an amazing, <laughs> wonderful new game called Pong you should try. Pong, that's pretty much where I'm coming from, and I love pinball. Ah, oh, pinball's so good. I miss the old <laughs> machines. Hey, you're right. But no, I'm not really a gamer at all, frankly. That's a bit of a shame. I know. So, let's see. It, it, it'll give me something to get into later. Exactly. So, what's your favorite... Who's your favorite anime character that you have voiced? Um, the... The series Heat Guy J is still one of my favorite series, and you're going to laugh because I cannot remember what his name what his name was now that I think about it. But I played the lead boy in this show, Heat Guy J, that for a minute was on MTV2. Um, I love that show. But it never really became that much of a thing. I remember seeing it. It's a shame it didn't become a big thing here in the States. Yeah, I thought it was a good show. So... Hikai J is my favorite. There are others that were fun, like uh, Sayuki was a fun show. That Just because that character was, um, I got to have fun with it. It wasn't just, you know, getting all screaming and yelling, Byakugan. <laughs> it, it, uh, it was just fun. Because, you know, you don't really get into recording dubbing like, um, uh, like doing a play or a movie. It's one line at a time that I've never seen before until I walk in the room. And so uh, a show like Sayuki or Sayuki Reload was fun because um, I got to create on the spot something more than just a young hero sounding thing. Not that there's anything wrong with that. So do you prefer playing the young hero or the villain? Well, villains are more fun, but I rarely get cast as the villain. Although, um... Uh, even though he's not a villain, this character in uh, Kill is sort of villainous, or at least he's sly, which um, which is kind of fun to get into, I have to admit. But I got nothing against young heroes. It's pretty much been my whole career. See, now we got to start petitioning to get you some hero or some villain roles. Some villain parts, totally. Let's get him the really dramatic, silly type of villain. Yeah. Was Harry McDougal a villain, would you think? Even though that was so long ago? Eh, Harry Mac? Could be, yeah. I just remember screaming, die, 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 die. <laughs> Have you ever actually lost your voice doing any of the characters? Oh my god, yes. All the time. It's hard. Uh, all that screaming, like um, all those ramping up uh, screaming efforts, like in... Um, well, Naruto Bleach with the... Uh, ah, ah, <laughs> like, those are hard to do that seven times in a row. I, well, yeah, I've done voicing. I can imagine just how bad it is. Yeah. I mean, it's part of the job. But, uh, but yes, I've lost my voice. It, it hurts. I hope you... Not as bad. Not as bad as like doing a zombie movie, though, doing ADR on a zombie movie. Um, all, all one time I did a character in, um, I played the, it, it was an anime, but it was a Marvel thing. And it was, uh, I played the son 
of either Magneto or of, um, oh my God, Patrick Stewart's character. Sorry. Magneto. <laughs> no, the Magneto and who else? Doctor, Doctor, um, was I Magneto's son? I think I was Magneto's yeah, son. Yeah, I think you were Quicksilver. Yes. That whole role was quite literally nothing but screaming, if you remember seeing that, where I was being tortured the whole time. How does it feel going into a booth and being told, all right, so you have to scream like you're being tortured. Should we poke you with a stick? Well, I feel two ways about it. Number one is I know how to create that because I'm an actor. <laughs> and uh, number two, I have to handle my attitude because... I know that it's going to hurt, you know, it, I know that it's going to hurt. It's like getting a shot and I'm going to have to scream and probably do it three or four times per line. And so I get a little trepidatious. You wouldn't think that screaming you'd have to do so many times, just scream and get it over with. <laughs> I know. Well, there's the timing. First of all, it has to fit since it's dubbing. And then there's a director's preference, which is how they want it to sound and, it doesn't always sound like that on the first try as much as I want it to. So we have a question from uh, Veridin, and he asked, when you were voicing Kadaj in Advent Children, did you do the face he makes? He was, ve he was a very expressive character. Um, I'm thinking about how to answer that. That was a unique situation that job because the directors uh didn't speak english and so they spoke to a translator who spoke to the director the english dialogue director who then spoke to me so i would give one line reading and then i'm not exaggerating at all they would talk about it for 10 or 15 minutes while i sat there and then i would do it again with the direction and then i would sit there for 10 or 15 minutes that job went on and on and on, thankfully. I mean, I love that job. It's one of my favorite jobs. But it, it wasn't just line after line after line. Like, I would do it once. I would say, blah, 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 mother's mimetic legacy. And then I'd wait for 10 minutes. And then they'd give another direction. And I'd say, blah, 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 mother's mimetic legacy. And then I'd wait for 10 minutes. So the truth is, in the moment, I'm just trying to keep it together, trying to come up with different ways to do the li the lines. And so I'm sure that I take from the face of the character that I see on the screen in front of me in order to help communicate what it is I feel like um, is going on on the screen. But of course, as you already know, it doesn't really matter what I do. It's what the director wants. It really doesn't have anything to do with me. It, me it has to do with can I deliver what they are looking for. Have you ever had a director that was just, don't have to use names, like nearly impossible to work with, that you just wanted to walk out? Well, I did walk out one time. <laughs> That's beside the point. <laughs> uh, no. I mean, we're, we're all, we all know each other, you know what I mean? I, I don't ever go into a room at this point where I don't know the person who's directing and, in fact, have known them for at least 10 years, you know? So it, it can get frustrating because it's hard um, since it's not math, what someone says and what I interpret can often be two different things, but you just keep trying it until, um, until uh, the director's satisfied, basically. Oh, let's see. We've got Gaming Writer who asked, you voice multiple versions and forms of the same characters in Digimon Frontier. What was that like? Uh, I loved that job. That was a long time ago at this point, and we were talking about it. Um, I guess directed a uh, kids voiceover class on Monday, and one of the kids came up and talked about how much he loved Digimon, and uh, that was fun because the character I played didn't just go through the standard motions of a little kid's um, action game. Like there was all that stuff with Koji's brother, and uh, I believe there was a death. You know, so it got it got serious which was fun because it was something interesting to have to come up with you know to call on those parts of yourself in creating line readings that fit like i said what the director wanted but also the tone of the show and there were a lot of people in on that show meaning there were producers sitting in, in and director and engineer 
sometimes it's just an engineer and a director and you, well, most of the time that's what it is. Digimon had a lot of people hovering in a way. <laughs> How does it feel with all those people watching you and there with you? Um, in the beginning, it can be disconcerting because you feel on the spot. Uh, but when you've come to voiceovers from acting, you're, everything you're used to doing is in front of people. So that's sort of just the way it is. And I'm good at tuning them out. Like I only look at the script. I don't look through the glass. I don't try to le lean in and talk. I just talk and they can hear me and I can hear them. And I keep my eyes on the page also because I have to read the next lines so that when we get to the next line, I'm ready to do it. Like I don't, no one's trying to waste any time, if you know what I mean. So I don't worry about the people who are watching, because the only person I'm ever talking to anyway is the director, so it doesn't matter what, uh, who's in the room. That's also a benefit of having done this for a lot of years. I don't think about that anymore. Kind of like hearing the sound of your own voice. It's awful at the very beginning, but now here I am 20 years later. It just doesn't bother me. <laughs> now, do you have any funny stories from when you were doing any voices? Huh. Well, yeah, when I walked out of that recording session, that's the funniest story I can ever think of. I mean, of course, I'm not going to tell you who it was or what show, but um, I will tell you the particulars because the people involved will also laugh. But it was my, on my birthday and there was a lot of screaming going on and it was a three hour session. And by the end of two and a half hours, I was just I couldn't do it anymore. And there was take after take after take. And finally, I stood up and I was like, look, I'm leaving. I can't do this anymore. I'll come back and finish some other time, but I'm walking. I'm leaving. I'm not doing this anymore. I've been here for three hours. I haven't taken a break. I need to go. And it was on my birthday. And as I was storming out, she said, no way. You, you can't go. We got you a cake. <laughs> Aww. <laughs> and um, so, of course, I instantly turned around and, and made the best, the best of it. And we all laughed. It's not like I cursed anybody. They're my friends. I just walked out because I couldn't take it anymore. But, but that's a funny story. You can't, you can't leave. We got you a cake. I, I can imagine that had to be funny. <laughs> cake will always bring you back then? Well, apparently. <laughs> now, um, have you any, do you do uh, conventions where you get to meet the fan stuff? And what's that like? Uh, you know what? I don't, I don't really do that. Um, and I don't really know why. I guess I haven't really pursued it because in my observation, those who do conventions pursue it th the same way you would pursue work. And so I suppose if I started to pursue that, I might, I might, um, go to some, uh, some conventions, but in, until then I haven't really looked into it. I've, I got an invitation or two, but nowhere really other than California. So I've been to Anime Expo and um, Comic Con a couple of times, and um, panels are fun, except when I get questions that I don't know how to answer, <laughs> or people are telling me about shows that I was on that I don't remember doing. That's when you just smile and nod. Smile and nod. See, now we're going to have to get you to a convention here in Florida. Okay. There you go. go. Hook it up. Where in Florida? Uh, Tampa, Orlando. All right, cool. There you Love. guys go. You got your mission. Let's get him to Florida. <laughs> totally. I haven't been to Florida since 1985. Wow. <laughs> Let's see. What questions do we have from the fans? There's a bit of a delay, so you'll have to forgive me. All right, so we have someone asking, uh, the last recording, last recording session for Bleach, how was it? And how did it? How do you feel knowing that Bleach has ended? Uh, uh, I hate that Bleach has ended because, and I know you'll get this, but if you look at it from my perspective of living my life, that's one of my jobs, and I've had that for years. We've been doing that show for years, and the ending is was uh, unceremonious. Like I, 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 I can barely even remember. I can barely even remember. It, it, it just was. She's. I think she said, uh, "Okay, this is the last one." And I was like, "Oh, okay." And then <laughs> I was probably only on for forty-five minutes, you know, to do whatever my lines were between my two characters, and then, and then I left. 
We didn't have a party or and anything. So completely unceremonious. I do know that later things like um, you know Rock Lee or Disc Wars have come up. So it and and I go to the studio where we do uh, did Bleach all the time. So it doesn't seem like it ended in a way. You know what I mean? Because I'm over there all the time. So when series ends, usually end, you guys have like a small party and stuff like that? Uh, it, it's random. Sometimes there's a party for stuff and sometimes there isn't. One time we had an awesome holiday party downtown at the Hollywood Athletic Club, which was an awesome party just in general. And then sometimes things just disappear the way uh, Bleach did. Oh, that's kind of a shame. In, in a way. Um, I... But we were, what's not a shame is to have an ongoing job for like six or seven years, however long we did that show. So the truth is there's nothing <laughs> shameful about it, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. All right, so we have somebody asking, <laughs> how did it feel playing an emo in Vampire Night? What? In what show? Uh, in Vampire Night? Yes. Uh, I like that because... Um, you know, when I'm sitting there dubbing, I'm kind of also watching the show. And so I always know if I'm into it when I'm asking to the director, saying to the director, so what happens? What happens after this? Because, you know, we just go from one line to the next. And sometimes if it's your last line in the scene and your next scene isn't until three scenes later, well, they skip to three scenes later and you never find out what happened. And so, um, uh, I, I like that show. It was dark in a cool way. Now, are you a big anime watcher? Do you watch it whenever you get the chance type of thing? No, that's kind of like games. I mean, if it's on TV, like when Bleach was on TV, every once in a while I'd, I'd, uh, I'd, um, I'd check it out. But uh, so, And sometimes we get DVDs from producers, which I will watch. But in some ways, I, I feel like I've seen it because I'm sitting there at work doing it. So th I guess that's my in involvement. But as far as um, pursuing it to watch it, uh, not particularly, no. Oh, well, at least you get to see some of it while you're working. Well, that's how I feel about it. Like, I feel I watch more anime shows than a lot of people because I'm, I'm in those shows, you know, but, uh, like different shows. Rock Lee, Disc Wars, which is, which is going on right now, and... I, so I feel like I'm watching those shows. Let's well, see. all the shows, really, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, Arshika asks, how do you prepare yourself for a voice of a character that's far from who you actually are, attitude-wise? Um, I, I think it's casting uh, is the answer to that question because it's not like it's a surprise to me when I go in. So if I've gone into work, it means somebody picked me to do it, and it means they know what I can do, and that's what they're asking. So the preparation to answer the question is doing plays since I'm nine years old and taking singing lessons and acting lessons and going and getting a degree in theater and, and being an actor, you know what I mean? And when it comes time to play a role like that, the preparation has been done, if that makes sense. I'm ready to do it because I auditioned and obviously what I gave in an audition is what somebody wanted to hire me for. And so I'm ready to, ready to go. Also on day one of a show, a lot of times you spend some time dialing the voice in what they're looking for. And then once you get it, they make a, a reference so that you can hear it every time you come to work because uh, it's kind of easy to forget where you where you were if the next time you come into work is two months later. <laughs> so that that's the preparation. Now, let's see. how are you going to look into exploring uh, directing work? Um, I actually would like to do that, but I have not put any effort into um, pursuing that, really. Uh, I know that a lot of my actor friends 
over the years, every once in a while, I'll show up and they will be directing a show. And I think, oh, I see. They must have moved forward uh, as a a director and put that as as one of their goals. So kind of like conventions, I suppose I could pursue that if I were to put effort in that direction. I do direct auditions sometimes at casting agencies here in town, but that's for commercials and um, st- uh, standard voiceover stuff, not dubbing, not animation, but uh, commercial calls through your agent. Oh, I see. Well, I think you'd make a good director. Oh, so I'll, I will. <laughs> I'll give your endorsement on my resume on a cover letter. <laughs> now, um, Das asks, have you ever recorded a show or anything similar that just never got to see the light of day or got canceled in the middle of the recordings? Hmm. Let me think about that. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, there is one situation, but it, it wasn't anime. It was a uh, an original animation, kids a kids show based on a children's book, and it got stuck in a, a legal battle after we did a couple of records, and it never came to anything after that. It was a musical, and they, I don't know how there were two sides. One guy was suing the other, and so the show itself was in limbo. But not an, not an anime. I think by the time a show comes to an, an English dub, it's the, the business plan is in place. It's ready to go. Do you remember the name of the show? Just out of curiosity. <laughs> the one, the one. It was called Room to Grow, and of course you wouldn't know it because it never, it never. That was it. Hmm, curious. Which um, I believe was based on a children's book, but that was actually a long time ago. Now I'm going to get sued. <laughs> Don't worry, no one remembers. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Let's see. Come on, people, ask your questions. All right, somebody asked, "How did you kind of stumble into doing voice acting? And did you would you have rather done live action? I'm not saying that you haven't, but." <laughs> um. Uh, after college, I moved up here to pursue my acting career, and as part of pursuing your career, you dabble in everything that an actor can make money in in Hollywood, and one of those things is voiceovers, and so I took a a class, um, like when I, you know, like when I was 23 or 24, and um, at the end of that class, I made a demo, and... Um, started shopping that demo around and unlike on camera i i got a lot of attention you know i got my phone calls returned and i got interviews with agents and then i got agents and had auditions and then the more effort i put into voiceovers the more i was feeling the love and was getting jobs and at a certain point I put my eggs into that basket because I felt that it was panning out for me, oh, panning out for me more than um, on camera. Now, do you find doing voice work a lot easier than being on camera, or do you find it a lot harder? Um, sim- simply put, it is easier. I mean, you don't have to go there at four o'clock in the morning. Like any, any time I've ever been in a movie, man, it's a long day or night, as the case may be, over not working overnight. And um, uh, acting is still acting. The only difference in voiceover is that it's not being recorded. But it is true that I don't have to wear a costume. I don't have to go to a costume fitting. I don't have to learn blocking. I don't have to worry about uh, hair and makeup. You know, it, it, so it is easier. Voiceovers is able to be more of a nine to five job than on camera, which are really long, unforgiving hours. No. And then there's, there's the stage, but that's stages with the stages. I was just about to ask, have you done any stage work and do you really enjoy it? Uh, Yeah, I love doing plays, and I've been in a bunch of plays out here in California um, just for fun, really. I mean, that's kind of 
what you do when you're an actor to keep your skills up. And um, uh, most of the plays that I like to do are musicals. If I'm going to do plays, because it's a lot of work, you know. And uh, so I've been involved in a few musicals. I was in a musical called Divorce the Musical a couple of years ago that a, f that a friend wrote. And we took it around to get backing. And then they uh, were able to produce it at the Hudson Theater in Hollywood. And, um, and yeah, I would like to do more uh, theater as, as time moves forward to get it to more See, we need to find some singing cartoons and stuff to get you in. Since I don't think there's a lot of singing animes. That uh, no, there aren't a lot of singing animes. <laughs> that one that I got um, confused in Legal Mumbo Jumbo was a musical. So I was really bummed that that actually didn't go. The main reason I was bummed it didn't go is because they weren't my job. But <laughs> but it was um, it was a, a bummer because it, that would have been a fun show to do. You know, to to sing. See, now they're asking to hear you sing. <laughs> uh, how's this? I'll put some. I'll I'll put something up on you on YouTube. There you go, guys. You'll be able to. I'll link in link you well, guys to his YouTube. I'll think of something to sing. <laughs> uh, they're at uh, anime lovers asking, what do you find easier, doing animes or doing American cartoons? Hmm. Huh. My honest answer is that it's it's really the same. Like when I talk to people, I still have to get in my car, drive to a studio, go in the room, pick up the paper, <laughs> look at the paper, and read the lines off the page. So in in that regard, in that regard, it's the same job. Does that make sense? So I wouldn't say one or the other is easier because. Uh, it's the same job. Now, granted, in um, anime, it's dubbing, so there is the extra and added effort of um, fitting the acting into a, a mouth that's moving in an unnatural way and uh, that kind of mimicry and skill of putting acting into those, those mouth movements. But once you figure out how to do that, then it's just acting. And so I would I don't think either are um, easier than the other. It really depends on what's being asked of you, you know? Is the character easy character to play or hard character character to play? Um how does it how did it feel when you first started having to go in and do cold readings of these scripts where you didn't have it in advance where you could look it over and study it? Where you, could, where you just have to go in, look at the lines once or twice, and then read them? Uh, there was a learning curve. Like, I was already good at this, so I knew how to do it. But I, but at the very beginning, way back, uh, I'm so awful with the names of the show, where there was, it was a show about twins. And we're talking like 18 years ago, 17 years ago maybe. And um, I think I played the twins. And... Um, there was a definite learning curve on that. It was hard to to teach myself how to do fresh line readings in the context of a of a um, the mouth movements. You know, to to try not to be cardboard and stiff when you're also trying to mimic a, a mouth movements. Oh, I can understand that. But like anything, you you get uh, better at it. So basically, now it's it's kind of more of a breeze to do because you're so used to it. Yeah, it it I it is. I'm a lot better at it than I was when I first started doing it, and um, I've built that skill up. You know, it's really a, a kind of like a muscle memory skill. And so I don't even think about it when it comes to dubbing anymore. <laughs> I just know how to do it. They show you a preview. I figure out what I'm going to do. We go for it on take one and see what happens. And then there's a redirect or, or 10. <laughs> or 20. Yeah. Now, Arshika asked, when you spend a long time voicing an actor, do you find – or an actor, yeah. Voicing a character, do you find yourself connecting to that character at all? Uh, I wonder. 
Not really, not really, because um, it's part of my day, if that makes sense. And like I said a minute ago, the reality is I got to get in my car, drive there. It's usually two hours. And then maybe I'll have to hurry up and leave there because I got to be to Beverly Hills at my agent to read commercial auditions or come home and record on my desktop the auditions that are due by 3 p.m. and and uh, and so on. That's what it's like in my day. And so I suppose my answer to that question is in the moment I connect because I'm there fully working on that show. Um and enjoying it in that way, but it's so fragmented and disjointed from our point of view. You know, we're only doing our lines, and sometimes you've got four pages where it's nothing but, huh, huh, hmm, ha, uh, huh, and you, and it's hard to even know what's going on because you're trying to get your lines done because maybe that's all the only lines you have to do, and they want it done in two hours rather than having to have you reschedule and come back because you couldn't finish and. So you see what I'm saying? So I, I connect to those characters, but mostly in the moment when I'm making an effort to connect so that I can create some kind of portrayal. Sounds like you're always busy. Does the word well, vacation mean anything? <laughs> yeah. It's feast or famine. I'm either busy or I'm not doing anything. Because oh. the, 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 the whimsy of the business. Now, is there any lull time with anime dubbing and stuff where it's not a lot of them, like any times of the year. Where... Yeah, the lull time started in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we when need the to bring more animes. economy crashed. There was a time before 2008 where I was probably doing four or five anime sessions a week on this, that, the other. And if I wasn't deleting character, I was coming in to do incidental parts or this part. And um, when the economy crashed, uh, a lot of that extra stuff kind of waned. I mean, I'm not certain that it's the economy, but it sure does seem to have gone along with it, and it does make sense. Now, with um, the economy crash, have you started looking for more American cartoons to do with there being not so many <laughs> animes? Um, I guess my answer to that question is yes. <laughs> always, always reading for stuff, always hoping to book stuff. The Warner Brothers did some shorts that I got in. Um, I don't think they're released yet, so I'm not going to say anything else about what it was, just in case I'm not supposed to, because I don't want to get busted. But uh, Can you even give us a hint? <laughs> War the Warner Brothers, how's that? <laughs> there we go. Well. Um, so that stuff's still out there. I did an episode of the show Chosen, which I think got cancelled, but if you remember the show Chosen, um... Late night cartoon, gay rapper. So I think I've seen one episode of it. Yeah. So I, in fact, I got to look that up. I'd actually like to see that episode. So, you know, that kind of stuff. And then, of course, games. I haven't been in a game in a while. In fact, just today I was like, I want to, I got to get in the game. You do. <laughs> we we yeah. love you in games. Totally. We love you in anything. I got to get another uh, oh. Star Ocean. Oh, yes. Star Ocean is so good. Yeah, that was a great job. See, none of you guys have bought Star Ocean. Go buy it. Go on. Go buy it. It's, at this point, it's old school, isn't it? A little, but old school is also good school. So Yeah. Uh, that was just a fun job. There were so many lines. <laughs> Same thing with, what was that? Oh, well, I don't remember. There, It doesn't matter. I don't remember what it was. I had another one where we just had thousands of lines. And then the Final Fantasies that keep uh, popping up. The game, that is. <laughs> well, I've heard that they're working on a new Final Fantasy VII game, so maybe there you go. You get, might have another part. I think so. A couple times a year I go in, but on that I'm always playing that, uh, not Lilliputian, but uh, what are those characters called? And where everyone has an English accent. So... Uh, <laughs> That game, that game looks fun. Let's see. Uh, Daz asks, what's your personal microphone and recording program that you use at home? <laughs> okay, it's called GarageBand. You might have heard of it. And um, I have a microphone, a Samson microphone that I got at Melrose Mac for $89 USB. 
That's a, that's as complicated as it gets. I was looking at your website and saw the other actors with their seven hundred dollar microphones and mix boards and everything, and I was like, whoa! I I plug mine into my USB every time I got to record, and I break it down when I'm done so that my desk isn't covered in recording equipment, and I use the the uh, tools in GarageBand to record, and you can make MP3s or WAV files from GarageBand, and it's it's served me right. I'll even do jobs from my desktop where I'm sitting right now. Hey, they don't say the most complicated is the best. The simplest is sometimes the best. That's what I go with. I've got two okay. mics on my desk. Yeah, it works. It works fine. I mean, at, at, when I bought it years ago, I, I wondered if I shouldn't be getting an expensive microphone. But then when I listen to my stuff on big speakers, it sounds it sounds great. You know, the digital age... It, the, the, you don't need an expensive microphone to sound great. In fact, truthfully, the, I can make a recording in my iPhone. That sounds just as good as a recording that I make on an expensive microphone on my desktop. All you need to know is how to clean it up a little bit. Yeah, if, if you even need to. Uh, somebody goes, I use MS Paint. That's not what MS Paint's used for, honey. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, I think I just use GarageBand because when I when – you know, there was a time when we were not recording at home, when voiceovers was all about just going to your agent and booking jobs. There was no such thing as recording at home. But then when that became the standard, you had you had no choice. You have to record at home now. And um, since I had a Mac, well, there was GarageBand. And the truth is, what more do you really need? I'm not mixing, you know, I'm not producing music. I'm giving auditions or... Or, you know, reading one-liners that go into a radio commercial or something. How does it feel getting to just work at home sometimes on your stuff? Um, it feels like sitting at your desk working. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because there's scripts to get through. There's a lot of um, uh, material. And so you got, i got to sit there and do a lot of takes and cl- keep it clean. And then, you know, spend time uploading it and so on. But that's not that's not all the time. Most of the time, if I'm working, I'm going to go to a studio. The only time I actually would work from here is if I get something from a out of state client, and they're doing it on the cheap, more or less, and so they're okay with it coming from my desktop as opposed to a ISDN session or something. Now, Arsh asked. If there's anything you could change about the voice acting industry, what would it be? Other than the pay, other than the pay. <laughs> um, I would change the practice of hundreds of actors auditioning for um, any given role. Uh, and I, I don't know exactly how I would do that. But right now we all audition at our agent's office. And so our agents pick who comes in. And a lot of those scripts go to many different agencies. So if every agency gave even five people, well, even at the end of 10 agencies, that's 50 people. But if there's 20, that's 100 people. And um, I haven't really thought through how realistic it it is, but I would love it if more like the old days, you were going into a casting agency and competing against only the people that the casting agent brought in not just everybody sending everything um, online. Wow, I didn't even realize that that's got to be a pain in the butt. Well, it, it hurts your statistics. I mean, it's hard to be the person who wins when there's 100 people or more auditioning. And it didn't used to be that way before the internet because you couldn't send files. You had to make a uh, hard recording and deliver it by hand. Now, with all that, have you had any recently in the last few years, had anyone contact you going, you know, you're perfect. We don't want anyone else but you. Uh, Yeah. At this point, jobs come up that I don't audition for. Like I did a one off in a Monster High movie and I didn't audition for that. The people knew me and they knew what they wanted and they called me up. And in fact, when I got in to the session, the first thing the director said to me is, you're here because we know what it is that you do and it is exactly what we want. That's all you have, that's all you have to do. I remember him saying that to me and I was like, fine, got it. (laughs) Sounds like a director you'd probably want to work with more and more. Yeah, no kidding. It was a good job. (laughs) (laughs) 
So is it very stressful going through auditions like that and having to wait on an answer or not? No. Um, it drives some people crazy, but I, it's never bothered me. It's always about reading the auditions and sending them. And I rarely, I rarely think of, about it after the fact. I, I don't even remember. A friend of mine said, what about that one thing that you were telling me about? And I was like, what are you talking about? What are you talking about? And then he explained it to me. And I realized, oh, right, I remember that. And then I think, wow, why didn't I get that? But I never think about that. There's always something to be done. I've got work to do or I've got a class to teach or I've got auditions to give. And then and that's that. I don't really ever think about it as not getting it or rejection. That doesn't mean I wish I wasn't getting more of them. But in terms of individually, eh. Now, are there any parts, be it stage, TV, movies, all that, that you would really like to play? Any character that you could play, who would you play? Uh, I don't know. Um, uh, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. I don't know. Antique Verbund, maybe. <laughs> we managed to stump you. Woohoo! <laughs> I know. I... I, I don't know. Um, There's no like musical characters from any cer certain musical musicals other than like the leads that you'd want to play because everyone wants to play the lead. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. Um, it'd, it'd be fun to be in Book of Mormon. Uh, I <laughs> so funny. Uh, what was I gonna ask? What was I gonna say to you about the? Um... Oh well, I don't know. I don't know what my dream role. Oh, it was what we were talking about earlier when we were talking about villains. That it would be fun to play a good villain. We need to get you in like a Disney villain role, make you be really sinister and funny. Love it. That would I would love to do that. All right, sinners, let's raise some money to make a movie and do find it. animators and uh, stuff. <laughs> Kickstarter, <laughs> where you can kickstart everything, even a potato salad. <laughs> that's a good idea. That's a. <laughs> That's true. I didn't know that, actually. Someone did it, and they took the money, and actually, I think they did a rock concert to give back for it. <laughs> yeah, I read that. Now you're making me hungry for potato salad. <laughs> I'm sorry. If it makes you feel better, I haven't eaten either, so. Well, it's late for you. It's dinner time for me. Let's see. Uh, Chrome asks, what's the difference between a lead role and a supporting role, in your opinion? Uh... <laughs> I pause because my answers are just so not what anyone wants to hear. A leading role means way more recording sessions. <laughs> An incidental <laughs> role means one job. Honestly, that's that's how I feel about that. Because it's like what I already said is it's it's never not me driving somewhere, going in, picking up the pages and reading the lines off the page. Whether it's seven years on one job or one job one time, it's the same job. Same thing. So I just, I know how to do that job. I show up and interpret the lines the way I'm asked to interpret them, whether it's a leading role or an incidental. It is what it is. The scene has demands, the character has demands, and you are there to fulfill the demands of the event, the scene itself, and what's being asked of you, and casting, how you, how you fit the part. So... Really, there is no difference in terms of my approach. So I actually guess that my answer is a leading role means more sessions. <laughs> now with video games, do you have to go through the same process of audition where there are thousands auditioning or is it a little easier? It's both. Video games happen through your agent and through people that uh, – just contractors that you know. And so sometimes when you're coming in for your contractors, you are coming in for a casting director and it's only the people that they have put forward for the part, not just everybody everybody reading. So it's it's both. Games are difficult to get and, and then also depending on who the developer is – you might have a, a easier shot because there aren't as many people auditioning. Now, I know like Warner Brothers, they do the booths with a bunch of people in there. Is it a common thing or do you mostly do your voicing and your, your lines alone? Mostly alone. 
dubbing always alone original animation often together like the last time i did that was on a show called secret millionaires club which is on hub network it's about kids and money and warren buffett that we recorded group style and um i was on a show called starship troopers some years ago and we recorded all of that group style but anymore you're recording by yourself just because of scheduling and the director is the, who's in charge. So the director knows from one act to the next how they want it to all fit together. And you just have to give truthful, in the moment, uh, line readings. Now, do you find it easier to do it in a group or do you find it easier to do it alone? It's easier to do it alone. Really? Yeah. Um, the group, there's... Uh, there's a lot going on. <laughs> There's just a lot of energy flying around when you're in the group, which can be fun, but also sometimes we're trying just to get it, get it done. I can imagine. You'd always get that one person that just wants to make jokes on everything. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. But, <laughs> um, but it is fun, and you get to socialize, and there's that aspect of it because voiceovers is pretty solitary, and it's not like being in a play where you get to sit around with your people all the time hang out and not be lonely and not be lonely <laughs> now are there any perks working under a company and how long is do they usually last before you have to renew your contract or they renew you for a contract um well technically what you're saying it doesn't work that way one, one, a job is a job. You audition for a part, you get the part, you're stuck with that part unless you get fired. And so you don't really ever work for a company. Every job is its own one-off job. And sometimes I have to prove that I'm a citizen four times in a week because every job is a new start form. And a, a new start means you have to fill out an I-9 paperwork and all, all the things that happen when you first get a job that most people – only have to fill out once, and then they work where they work for five or ten years, and that's that. But I got to fill it out every single time, and so there is no protection. You're just unemployed until you book another job. So you you figured out those those forms by heart by now. You can write you write them with your eyes closed. Right, like like having your driver's license number memorized, which is something that most people don't have, but I I do. Now, Arshika asks, do you think voice acting has changed or enriched your life? as both an actor and or as a person? Um, well, the most obvious answer is yes, of course, because it's how I make my living, you know, pays my mortgage and buys the food that I eat and et cetera. But um, as, far, or as far as artistically, uh, definitely, because when I was a kid, all I did with my friends was goof around and make funny voices and mimic people and all of that, none of which I realized was training ground for what would eventually become my career so to be able to use those skills as a way to make money is uh, intensely gratifying and so to that degree enriching yes see guys voice acting can help your life see <laughs> so I, sometimes we're doing movies and i say things like you guys we're not curing cancer let's just get this done <laughs> Oop, did we lose you on skype uh, no, no, I'm here. I just, that was, that thought was really quick. Let's see, I'm Can just you... looking to see if they have anything new. Yeah. Because we have a small delay in the questions. Let's see. How long exactly have you been in the voice acting business? If you don't mind uh, telling us. I'm like 21 years. See? Now you're legal to drink in the in uh, yes, voice acting years. Year. So if you're 21, you were born the year that I started doing voiceovers. So that's why when I say things like, well, I drive to the place and it's a piece of paper and I act out the lines, that's where that's coming from. That's a long time to be doing what in execution is a relatively easy job, if that makes sense. It's hard to do and it's hard to be good at, but essentially it's easy. You know what I'm saying? And so uh, – it, if I sound cavalier at times, I don't know if it's cavalier. It's just because I've been doing it a really long time. And so it, uh, 
it's more second nature to me than it is special sometimes. Now, how does it feel when you go into the studio and you've got a bright eyed, starry eyed newcomer coming in and you've been doing this so long? Is there anything you give them as tips or anything? No, I'm happy for them. It's cool because it's hard to get into. It's hard to rise above and um, beat out the competition essentially to get a foothold inside show business in in any degree. So I'm I'm happy for for those people. I don't know if I have tips for them. I mean, I guess I teach classes for a casting director, and when people take that class, I have tips, or you know, we talk about things that that come up in terms of in administration of a career. But um, mostly, if I'm working with someone new, I'm happy that they've made the grade, they made the cut. Now, what would you give? Because I know a lot of people want to get into voice acting. What kind of advice would you give them? Uh, that they need to to study acting. That they gotta go do plays and take singing lessons and um, uh, be uh, read because most people make the mistake of thinking that voice acting is voice acting. That it isn't the same thing as on camera acting or anything else. And the truth is, it's it's acting. You're just not being filmed or you're not standing out in front of people on a on a stage. And you got to be a good actor to be good at voiceovers. So that is my advice. Study acting. Now, have you be ever had a character where you've really had to throw your body into it as your voice acting? Yeah. I mean, that's, in fact, that's part of technique. You, you have to use your body in voice acting, even if, even if you're sitting down because you're you're gesturing there you're using your face you know you're using your your body so that's a given that's always happening now are there any funny bloopers that we can find of you voice acting <laughs> um I, where do i i have one in my itunes <laughs> i i think um i wonder if i open itunes will it, will it play while we're talking, hmm, not sure. I don't even know where it where it is. Um, <laughs> it was a Di Gurren, a Di Gurren, um blooper. That's really awesome because I I timed it wrong or said it wrong. I don't know how I'm ever going to find it, but so I don't know. Maybe there's uh maybe there's some good bloopers um on online but none that i can think of off the top of my head i am still going to try to find this for you because my itunes is not that loaded <laughs> but uh every once in a while a while they'll make a blooper reel at a show from the funny things that you say no um it's a guy here it is Ooh. Let's. Uh, so I'm just gonna play it and see what happens. Okay. All right. Die good and hurry up. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> I couldn't. I couldn't say it right. I. So there you go. There. There you go. Die good and hurry Maru. They need to have more of the bloopers and DVDs and stuff. <laughs> uh, totally. Well, I'm sure that one wouldn't exactly fly, but. <laughs> Now, um, somebody's asking, what do you think the age cutoff for trying to become a voice actor is? It doesn't. A rookie? It doesn't matter. What matters is that you're a good actor and that you have um, uh, an interest in acting and show business. So, like, uh, taking a class, like the class that I'm going to leave here in a few minutes to go teach tonight... Um, has people of all ages in it, into their 60s and 70s. Wow. Yeah. And That's the beauty of acting, is it requires all shapes and sizes, ages, and so on. Well, you've got to get to your class, and we want to thank you for coming, but would you mind doing a shout-out for us? Yes. Who would you like me to shout-out to? You guys at um, um, Sinners? Yes, if you wouldn't mind saying, I'm Steve Staley, and I'm a sinner. Oh, I would be happy to. Hi, everybody. I'm Steve Staley, and I'm a sinner. 
Thank you so much, and have fun at your class. Oh my gosh, that was fun. So uh, we'll uh, we'll be in touch, I assume. And uh, thanks to everybody who tuned in and was interested in caring about anything that I had to say. And thank you for asking me. So um, hopefully we'll speak soon and we'll get to meet in person at some point. Hopefully. So we'll talk again another time. Hopefully you'll come get see the Sinners again. We know they love you and they love all your voices. Go Sinners! Thank you. Here, I'll leave you. I'll play this one more time. I couldn't hold you. Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> Goodbye. Signing off. See you later. Bye.